My relationship with God is based on God. Amen. My relationship with God is not based on people. Amen. My relationship with God is not based on church or on an organization. My relationship with God is based on who he is. Amen. Okay, so when, when things happen to us and things are going to happen to us, okay, because you live in a flesh suit and every, every person in this room, we're all people, we're all fallible. We all make mistakes. <clears throat> I told you on the very first service we ever had at this church, I am going to fail you from time to time because that's just who I am. I'm a fallible person, all right? God ain't ever going to fail you. He's never going to fail you, okay? So, uh, yeah, keep your focus on him. Keep, keep your faith in him. It was like I was telling you a couple of weeks ago. Paul said, when I first came to the Corinthian church, he says, I didn't come to you as a fancy preacher. I came to you in the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit because I don't want your faith to be in me. I want your faith to be in the power of God. Yes. Amen. The power of God can change your life. Amen. All right. Amen. Tonight is membership night. Woo! So uh, for those of you who have never been here before, we're doing something a little different. This is the first time we've ever had a membership night here at Faith Life Worship Center. Our church is nine months old. We just turned nine months old a week ago. And I just, yeah, amen. It's been a good nine months. <clears throat> it's been a productive nine months. We've done a lot of amazing things in nine months. Uh, you know, I, I look back at what we've been able to accomplish as a body in just nine months. I mean, the, the motorcycle rally that we did back in uh, April, you know, 160 people showed up for that thing. We had 60 bikes here. We gave away a Harley Davidson. I mean, that, that was an awesome thing. <laughs> the, the Collier County Fair outreach that we did. And uh, we fed uh, all of the workers uh, at the fair. We fed them breakfast every other day for the entire uh, run of the fair. And, um, you know, just uh, the, the VBS that we had. Um, you know, there... <laughs> There are churches who are much larger than our church that had VBSs that were about the same size as ours was. I was very, uh, very pleased with the, 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 the way that this church presented itself to the community. The way that this church represented Christ. Uh, we, we've had a great nine months. But how many know that uh, when you carry something for nine months, it's about time to give birth? Yeah. Amen? So uh, <clears throat> we're going to talk about membership tonight, and even if you're not a member or even if you have no uh, intention of becoming a member, uh, I, I think that what I'm going to share with you tonight is going to be encouraging, it's going to be eye-opening, and uh, the, you know, like, like it was already said, there's a reason you're here tonight, amen? Let's talk about membership. Nowhere in the Bible does it require a Christian to be a registered card-carrying member of a church or a denomination or anything like that. Those kinds of things are man-made, okay? However, the Bible does say that Christians should be involved in church. Hebrews chapter 10 says this, and I'm sure we've read this many times. Verses 24 and 25, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. All right, so this says that we need to assemble ourselves together. Assembling ourselves together allows us to provoke each other towards love and towards good works. That's a good thing, right? In other words, we receive encouragement from each other towards the work of the kingdom when we assemble with other believers. All right? We're encouraged. Now, it says don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. So even back in the early church, I mean, this was written almost 2,000 years ago, some Christians didn't believe in going to church. And today, there are some Christians that don't believe in going to church. In fact, some Christians actively preach against going to church. I've, I've heard Christians do that before. In virtually every instance that I've ever seen of this, of people that don't go to church and preach against going to church, in almost every single instance, it's because they've been hurt. Yeah, yeah. 
they've been hurt by the church, they've been offended by somebody, they've been hurt by a person. They, and, and that goes back to what I was just saying a few moments ago. Your faith can't be in church. You can't put your faith in a church. You don't put your faith in a pastor. You don't put your faith in a man. You don't put your faith in a body of believers. Your faith must totally rest on the word of God. Amen. That's it. My faith rests on this. I don't have faith in people, but I do know that I need to be around people. Yeah, that's right. I need to encourage people and I need to receive encouragement from people. Yeah, right. As we just sang a few minutes ago, I pray for you. You pray for me. I am for you and you are for me. I'm only going to speak words of encouragement. I'm not going to speak words of strife. I'm not going to speak words that, di that divide. I, I want us to go forward. I want us to be strengthened. I want us to be united because we're stronger as a body than we are separately. Amen. We're greater than the sum of our parts. Amen. Now, I know all about being hurt by churches. I've been a worship pastor. Prior to becoming a, a senior pastor, I was a worship pastor for 25 years. Now, there's one thing that probably is... Uh, more uh, critical and more uh, touches people's emotions more than anything else in church, and that's music. And I've been a music director, a worship pastor for 25 years. I know all about being hurt. I know all about being offended. I, I've seen pastors stand up in a in, you know, in front of a congregation and beat them with the word and and throw the law at them and preach angry. And people will endure that. But you play one song that they don't like and you're going to hear that. You're going to hear about it. I spent a lot of my career being hurt and criticized by churches and by church people. But my faith isn't in people. My faith is in God. My faith is in his word. My faith is in his covenant. And even though the hurts that I faced have profoundly affected me. And you, you can't help but let it affect you, both as a person and as a minister of the gospel. I refuse hurt to sideline me. I refuse the hurts to cripple me, to paralyze me, to keep me from going forward. Okay? I, I'm setting those things aside, pushing those things to the past. I look forward. I press towards the goal. I press towards the mark of the high calling. Put the past in the past. Amen? <laughs> the Bible tells me that I need to fellowship with other, with other believers. So I do. One of the things that I said from the very beginning of this church is that I wanted us to, to uh, fellowship after service. I didn't want church to be a place where we come together and sing a few songs and listen to a sermon and then go home. No, we need to fellowship. We need to congregate together. We need to build relationships. We need to build and strengthen uh, one another in unity. And that's one of the reasons that uh, I said at the very beginning of our church, I said, I, I want us to have a cafe and have some, uh, you know, some snacks and refreshments and, you know, uh, something to eat, something to drink after, after service. And uh, they just took it and ran with it. And now we have a full-blown meal after every single service. And I love that. Because more, I, I believe more good is done out there sometimes than it's done in here. Because we are building each other up. We're strengthening each other. We're encouraging one another. When you build relationships with people, it, it, it decreases the enemy's ability to get a wedge in there and drive people apart. Relationship fixes so many things. The more you know somebody, the better you can communicate with them. The more you know somebody, the less of a chance there is for miscommunication and misunderstanding. Okay? I can say things to my wife that I can't say with anybody else in this room because we've been married for 21 years. And she's not going to misinterpret what I say or how I say it. Or my tone of voice. I can use a tone of voice with her that I can't use with you. Because if I did, you'd be like, well, what's wrong with him? Why is he so angry? Well, I'm not angry. I'm just being me. 
okay? Maybe I'm, maybe I'm always angry. No, I'm kidding. <clears throat> but I, I believe it's important for a body to fellowship together. In fact, the Bible even backs that up. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. This is right after uh, the baptism of the Holy Ghost first happened in the upper room of the temple in Jerusalem. After that, Peter preached the first sermon that was ever preached in the, in the New Testament church. And 3,000 people were added to the church at that point. And then it says, after that, in Acts chapter 2, 42, it says, they were continually and faithfully devoting themselves to four things, to the instruction of the, of the apostles, and to fellowship, to eating meals together, and to prayers. Four things that the early church was devoted towards. Instruction, that means instruction and in doctrine. Instruction in the word of God, being taught, listening to a sermon, listening to teaching, being instructed. Number two, fellowship with each other. That's why we do things like ladies fellowships and guns, grub and gasoline, yeah. like we did with the men back in June. Motorcycle rides. Uh, I took uh, somebody on a flight uh, last night. That was a lot of fun. Took Allie on a flight with her mom and her sister. Allie uh, Perez, she won our uh, youth group t-shirt designing contest. And that was the, uh, the prize. Uh, sporting events and doing fellowship and, and events together. Amen? Number three, eating meals together. Well, we do that every, after every single service. And number four, prayers. Now, corporate worship is a form of prayer. Praise and worship is the highest form of prayer. Worshiping God, praising God, that's the highest form of prayer. You know, we, we seem to think about prayer as a way of us to, you know, go before God and ask God and tell God what we want. But the, a higher form of prayer is to go before God and give Him praise and worship Him and lift Him up. Okay? But notice prayer is plural. Eating meals together and to prayers. There's different kinds of prayers. Worship is prayer. Praise is prayer. Altar ministry is prayer. You know, we, we, we do a lot of different kinds of prayer. We have ladies' prayer meetings. We, we have a lot of different types of prayer. Prayer for the sick. Corporate prayer. Prayer in the Spirit. We talked about that during the, uh, the Holy Spirit series. It's important to pray in the Spirit. Amen? Amen. When you're praying in the Spirit, you're digging up those mysteries. When you're praying in the Spirit, you're allowing the Holy Spirit to pray God's perfect will through you. Now, none of these four things, the instruction, the fellowship, the eating of meals, and the prayers, none of these four things are listed as having more importance than any of the others. They're all equally important. They're all needed to have a balanced, healthy development of your relationship with Christ. Amen? If all that you have is prayer and worship, but you have no instruction in the word, then you're not going to have any depth of understanding in kingdom principles. All you're going to have is a bunch of emotionalism. And when the emotion lifts, you'll have nothing left to stand on. Amen. So you can't just have prayer and just have worship. You've got to have instruction. If all you have is instruction in the word, but none of the other things then all you have is a school, yes. not a church. Yes. We're called to be a church. You'll usually end up with dry, staunch intellectualism. You'll have religiosity, but you won't have any real personality. You'll find it extremely difficult to connect with people on a personal level because you're all, all you're doing is feeding your intellect with instruction. If all you have is fellowship and meals together, then what you have there is a country club. Okay? Now, country clubs are nice, but they don't change lives. The church is called to change lives. Amen? So, as I stated a little bit ago, membership of a church is not a scriptural requirement. Well, if that's the case, then why do it? If membership is not a scriptural requirement, why do it? Well, I've got a couple of reasons here, a few reasons. Number one, membership of a church shows commitment to the work of the kingdom. 
It shows that you're willing to yoke yourself to a group of like-minded believers and to do something together that is productive for the kingdom. Right. Amen? It shows commitment to the work of the kingdom. Number two, it shows a willingness to lower your defenses and to allow yourself to be vulnerable with other people. And that's kind of what Sherry was just talking about a few moments ago. You know, we need to allow our heart to, we need to allow ourselves to put the shields down once in a while when, when, when we're around other people. I know sometimes we have past hurts and things that we've dealt with, but you need to get over that so that you can grow and go forward in the things of God. Amen? Yeah. You need to develop relationships and learn how to trust people despite past hurts. Amen? Number three, it also helps the church in matters of business. For example, a church cannot apply for a loan without showing a membership roster. If we wanted to go to a loan or a bank and say, uh, we'd like to take out a mortgage and, and uh, buy some land or buy a building or, or, or whatever, they're not just going to look at the income of the church. They're going to say, how many people have joined your organization and have made a commitment to stand by you. It's not just the money behind it. They want to know who is behind it. Okay? They don't just want you to show your income. They want to know how many people are on board. And when it comes to membership, my observation is that most churches make membership way too complicated. They want to do classes that last for weeks or sometimes even months. They want to spend hours and hours explaining the tenets of faith and their doctrine. Uh, I had a friend um, about 15 years ago, he had moved from Ohio to South Carolina. And when he, he, he took a job in South Carolina and he moved his family down there and they were church shopping and they were trying out a bunch of different churches. And he said, you know, he, he called me one day, he said, I am sick and tired of pastors standing in a pulpit telling the church what they believe. He said, I don't want you to tell me what you believe. Do what you believe, and then I'll know what you believe. Okay? You don't have to tell me that you believe in healing. If I see you praying for the sick, then I know that you believe in healing. Okay? You don't have to tell me that you believe in the gifts of the Spirit and the baptism of the Spirit and the manifestations of the Spirit, if I see the gifts of the Spirit in operation in your church, then I'm going to know that you believe it. So don't, don't stand up and tell me what you believe. Do what you believe. And then that way I'll know. You know, the Bible says to not be a hearer of the Word, be a doer of the Word. All right? So if anybody would like to know our tenets of faith, our our list of beliefs, they're all listed on our website, okay? I took several days putting these things together, and I put them up on the website, so if you want to know what our beliefs are, just go to our website. It's, it's there. But I, I don't want to take service time to explain every single uh, tenet of doctrine that we believe. Um, and in fact, I would encourage people to go to our website and look those things up. Some people say, well, what is the vision of the church? Well, the vision of the church was communicated on our very first service nine months ago. And that service is also on our website in actually two different places. And uh, basically, the vision of the church is in the name of the church. Catch the football. Catch the football. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Faith, life, worship, center. The vision of our church is we are a church that teaches Faith and the principles of faith and how faith works and how faith doesn't work and what things come against faith and what things build your faith and how to operate in faith and how to apply your faith. Life, this word of God isn't any good if you don't know how to apply it to your life. So we're a church that talks about life, that talks about how to pay your bills and how to have a successful marriage and how to raise your kids and, and how to apply this thing to your life. If all I ever do is stand up here and give you theory but no application, then how is that going to change your life? Worship, Faith Life Worship Center. We are a church that is a worshiping church. 
We love to worship God. God is worthy of our worship. And we are going to make room for God to move in, in worship. We kind of had a short worship session tonight because I wanted to get into this. But we're a church that worships. And then center. I want this church to be a center where people can go to have their needs met. If they need encouragement, they can come here. If they need healing, they can come here. If, if they need prayer, they can come here. If they have a physical need, they can come here. You know, we want to be a center that people can turn to, okay? Now, Jesus is the center, but I, I want this church to be a center, all right? So as far as our beliefs and so, as far as our vision goes, if you want to know more about that, just go to the website. The, there was a message. It was, it was called, Our Vision is in Our Name. So uh, you can learn all about the vision of the church. But I don't want to overcomplicate membership to our church. Here's, here's how I look at membership. And it goes back to the story of the prodigal son. How many of you are familiar with the story of the prodigal son? Okay. Uh, I want to pay close attention not to the prodigal, but to the brother of the prodigal. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the story of the prodigal son really quickly. And then we're going to focus on the brother of the prodigal son. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 31. <clears throat> Jesus tells the story. He says, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. So that's the story of the prodigal son. Now let's talk about his brother. Verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, everyone say near the house. Yes. This is a very important thing to understand. Where was the older son? Yes. Near the house. Was he in the house? No. Was he in the field? No, but he was near the house. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your, your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. And he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you, f you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So let's break some things down here. Where was the older son? He was near the house. He was not in the house. He was not in the field. He was near the house. 
Now, it says when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. Now, if you can hear dancing, <laughs> either everybody's wearing clogs and tap shoes, or people are really throwing down. Okay? He heard music and he heard dancing. There is a party going on right here. A celebration to last throughout the years. A little cool on the gang there. He's near the house and he hears music and dancing, but he doesn't know what's going on. Now put yourself in his shoes. You're standing near the house. You hear the music. You hear the dancing. You hear the party going on. You don't know what's going on in the house. You want to know what's going on in the house. What would you do? Go in the house. But he didn't go in the house, did he? He called the servant. And the servant said, your, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has brought him back safe and sound. Now, some translations of this verse, the servant says, in one translation, he says, well, haven't you heard? Your brother's back. Another translation says, well, don't you know? Your brother came home. In other words, the servant is saying, you're a member of this family. Why do I know what's going on in the house and you don't? Now think about this for a moment. They had to kill a calf. They had to prepare a calf. They had to cook the calf. They had to prepare for the party. They had to invite people. They had to hire the DJ. Okay? I don't know what kind of DJs they had back then, but... In other words, this, this wasn't put together in a few minutes. This, it took a while to prepare for this party, and yet the older son had no idea what was going on in the house because he was near, near the house. But he wasn't in the house. Don't you know what's going on? I'm a servant, and I know what's going on. So the older brother became angry, and he, and he refused to, to go in. The older brother stood outside the house and criticized what was going on in the house. And it occurred to me one day as I was reading this, maybe the older brother wouldn't have allowed bitterness to get into his heart. Maybe he wouldn't have been so angry if he would have just gone into the house and joined the party. If he would have just walked into the house and grabbed himself you know, a red plastic cup, <laughs> And the little Sharpie, so you can put your initials on it so nobody else takes your cup. You, you know how it works. Maybe if he would have gone in and enjoyed the party, he wouldn't have allowed bitterness and anger to keep him from what was going on in the house. The father says, everything in my entire estate belongs to you. By the way, that's, that's our position in the body of Christ as well. We are sons. Remember we talked about that in the Holy Spirit series? We've graduated from being a child of God to being a son of God. That means that we're eligible for the entire estate. We are inheritance. We, are, we have an inheritance with, G, with Jesus. We're joint heirs with Christ. Amen? So the father tells the older son, everything in my entire estate belongs to you. If you wanted a party, all you had to do was ask. If you knew your position in the family, you wouldn't be complaining. Because all you had to do was ask. I would have given it to you. Amen? He didn't know the position that he had. He didn't, he didn't know his family well enough to know that all he had to do was ask his dad, can I have a party? He was totally disconnected with his family. He didn't care enough about what was going on in the house to actually go in and ask somebody. Instead, he asked the servant because he knew that the servant would know more than he knew because he wasn't in the house. He was near the house. There's a big difference when it comes to church. There's a big difference between being near the house and being in the house. A lot of times people will come to church and they will spectate, but they don't participate. That's right. That's right. 
They come to church and they watch what's going on, but they don't really want to engage with what's going on. That's near the house. It's not in the house. I've seen this in 26 years of a career. Some people come late to church so they can skip praise and worship because all they want to do is hear the sermon. Or some people leave early so that they can skip the sermon because all they want to hear is the praise and worship. That's near the house. That's not in the house. Some people come to church well, once in a while, but they're not a regular attendee. Okay? It's real quiet now. <laughs> That's near the house. That's not in the house. Some people do come to church regularly, but they don't volunteer in church. They don't help out. They just want to come. They want to attend. They want to be fed, but they don't want to give of themselves. They don't want to give of their talent. They, would, they don't want to give of their finances. They don't want to support the ministry financially. They just want to come and uh, be entertained or have their conscience soothed or hear some good music. Or hear uh, a word that encourages them and then they, they, they go back out. Okay? That's near the house, but it's not in the house. Or people come to church for services, but they don't come to any of the events that the church puts on. Fellowship events and outreach events and projects like that. Uh, one day I was um, looking at hiring a, a contractor to do uh, some work for me. And this guy, he was a young man, he was a business owner, and he was a student leader in a church that I used to work for. And uh, I went and met him to talk with him about this project that I wanted to do and that I wanted to hire him for. And uh, we met and he shook hands and I gave him my name and he gave me his name. And he goes, so what do you do for a living? And I said, I'm the worship pastor of the church where you serve as a student leader. <laughs> and he goes, oh, oh, yeah. Uh, I guess I haven't been in the, uh, the sanctuary uh, very much lately. Uh, that's why I didn't recognize you. I said, well, that's totally understandable. I've only been there five and a half years. <clears throat> that's somebody who's near the house, but he's not in the house. Okay? The, the worship pastor is the second most visible person in a church. The first most visible person is the pastor. The worship pastor has a lot of stage time. All right? And this was a person who was a leader in, in that church. Okay? Now, here's the thing. I'm not saying that you have to legalistically attend and participate in every single thing that a church does. Okay? What I'm saying is, if you want to be a member of the church, get in the house. Okay? I, I, I don't want to try to quantify what it takes in order to be a member. Well, you have to volunteer so much, and you have to attend church so much, and you have to give so much money, and, and all that kind of thing. Just get in the house. Just... Be interested enough to, in, uh, to inquire what's going on in the house. The older son wasn't even interested enough to go into the house and find out what was going on. He asked the servant because he knew that the servant was more in the house than he was, which is funny because the servant was also outside of the house, right? But the servant knew what was going on. Get in the house. Look at somebody next to you and say, get in the house. <laughs> attend church services as regularly as you can attend church functions as regularly as you can volunteer as regularly as you can support the church financially as regularly as you can know what's going on in the house because you're connected with the house amen, amen? if you have to ask well am I in the house well then you're probably not <laughs> okay you know if you're in the house. You know if you're connected or not. You know if, if you're in support of the vision of the house and you know what's going on and you want to be a, a part of it and you want to make a difference. Amen? There are at least five families that I can think of right now off the top of my head that live outside 
of Naples, Florida, and are not able to attend Faith Life Worship Center. Yet, they watch every single one of our services online, and they regularly support this ministry financially. Wow. Okay? Five families that I can think of right now. I, maybe more if I thought about it a little longer. But at least five families don't live in Naples, are not able to attend here, and whenever they come into town, they do attend. And whenever they come into town, if we have an, a function going on or some sort of project or outreach or that, that we're doing, they're involved in that. But even though they live outside of Naples, they watch every single service and they support this ministry financially. You know what? They're in the house. Yeah. Okay? They can't do everything that you and I can do, but they do what they can. The older son didn't do what he can. All he had to do was walk in the house. But he wasn't connected with what was going on in the house. Okay? If you want to be a member of this church, all I say is get in the house. Okay? I, I, I can't quantify that. You know where your heart is. You know what you can do. You know how you can connect to the house. And so... What we're going to do here in just a moment is I'm going to pass out some forms. And if anybody wants to officially declare that they would like to be a member of this church, then as long as you feel that you're in the house, then let's do it. You know, I, I don't want to make it. A, you can give God praise for that. I, I don't want to make it a big uh, process and a big uh quantifiable, you know, a bunch of hoops that you have to jump through in order to become a member of our church. There are people who are involved with this church who also worship at other churches. Okay? I don't have a problem with that. Amen. I think it's a blessing. You know, I, I, I had questions, honestly. When we first got into this building and I found out that we couldn't have services on Sundays... Because this building was already being used by two other churches on Sundays. So we couldn't do Sundays. So I, I thought, well, what kind of church services are we going to have? Are we going to do Saturday mornings or Saturday nights or Friday nights? or What, what, what are we going to do? And we chose Saturday night. And then our midweek service is not Wednesday like a lot of churches are. Uh, our midweek service is on Thursday nights. So I didn't realize how much of a blessing it would be having a church that has services on Thursday nights and Saturday nights because we are not in conflict, as far as a schedule goes, we're not in conflict with hardly any other churches in town. And if people want to be involved in more than one church, why would I want to interfere with that? Okay? If you're in the house, that's all I care about. Okay? So, high five somebody and say get in the house. <laughs> All right. So here's what we're going to do. I have a membership request form. I'm going to hand these to Don. He's going to pass those out. And if you would like to be a member, officially uh, a member of Faith Life Worship Center, uh, you can make that known through this uh, membership form. And the form says this, I, the undersigned, hereby express my intent and desire to become a member of Faith Life Worship Center of Naples, Florida. I am familiar with and in full agreement with the vision of the house. I understand that Faith Life Worship Center's vision is outlined in its name, a church that teaches the biblical principles of faith, a church that teaches how to apply God's kingdom principles to our daily life, a church that endeavors to worship God in spirit and in truth, and a church that is a center for people to turn to when in need. I am familiar with and in full agreement with the tenets of faith for Faith Life Worship Center, which are listed online under our beliefs at faithlifeworshipcenter.com. I fully intend on being in the house, not merely near the house, as explained in the story of the brother of the prodigal son written in Luke 15. I will attend Faith Life Worship Center services as regularly as possible. I will attend church functions as regularly as possible. I will volunteer as regularly as possible, and I will financially support the church as, as regularly as possible. 
I understand that my membership with Faith Life Worship Center will continue as long as I maintain these behaviors to the best of my ability and availability. I am in the house. Amen. All right. Hey everybody, this is Pastor Heath Jarvis from Faith Life Worship Center, and I hope that you really enjoyed the message that you just saw. And if you like this message, check out our other videos, and be sure to subscribe to our channel. Go to faithlifeworshipcenter.com where you can learn all about our church, our service times, and everything that's going on, and we would love to see you really soon at Faith Life Worship Center.